It's a mind-boggling achievement. How they how they achieved that level of uh, of accuracy and uniformity. It's it's staggering how they achieved it. Guys, uh, welcome to the Kedem channel and uh, today I am very glad to have with us uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kim Phillips. He is from Cambridge and he is working on the Geniza from Cairo. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Hi. That's true. Great to be with you. Uh, but today we want to talk with you on the biblical text. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. actually we all know the Bible, mm -hmm. how it looks like, or the Hebrew part which we call Tanakh. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to ask a simple question. <laughs> when it was written and combined into the text <laughs> as we see it today? A simple question, yeah. <laughs> very simple question. Yeah, yeah, right. But very long answer. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, let's, uh, let's take this in stages. Um, from around about the third century BC, BCE, we start to have actual manuscript evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls, of course. Um, and from then on, in some sort of fashion, we can begin to trace, based on manuscripts, the development of the text right up until the first uh, complete Hebrew Bible, um, Tanakh, uh, which, is, uh, which is actually from the year 1008 ADCE. So it's, uh, it's quite late for, for, for people who are unfamiliar with the story. It can seem very late. Um, I have a copy of it right here. The uh, so-called Leningrad Codex. Uh, this is obviously just a copy, not a uh, facsimile. Um, it's still, I think, stored in uh, St. Petersburg. It is still in St. Petersburg, yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, codex Evra 2 B19 A. It's a, a magnificent codex. Um, and of course, it's not the, it's not the first time that uh, the, the, the Hebrew Bible was written in full, um, but it is the earliest complete copy that is still extant today. What you're saying, actually, you have uh, two points in time. One is Qumran, mm -hmm, yes, mm -hmm. the inscriptions which we found there, and mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. uh, codex, which is uh, what we can buy in any shop. Actually. Precisely. Already among the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can detect a process. Some see it as a deliberate process. Some see it as more happenstance um, of one particular form of the Hebrew Bible becoming authoritative. So. Generally, it's assumed that it's the uh, the form of the Hebrew text um, that you that is preserved in temple circles, um, and we've got evidence that 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 there was a, a diligent effort to preserve that text letter by letter, right back into say the third century BC BCE and and perhaps even further back beyond then such that by the time we get to the end, say, of the first century AD, CE, um, we really have a consonantal text that is, that is virtually identical with the, with the consonant, consonantal text that we find in, uh, in the medieval manuscripts. But mm. generally speaking, uh, in Qumran we already have quite a familiar text, right? Yes, from a, from a broad perspective, uh, almost any of the biblical texts at Qumran read pretty much like the biblical text that we're used to. If you zoom in, then you start to notice that some texts uh, look somewhat different. So if you were to, to go to Jeremiah, for example, then the text there looks, actually looks, uh, some of the texts of Jeremiah look a little bit more like the Greek translation of, of Jeremiah, um, which was done, say, in the second century BC, BCE. Um, Likewise, the text, some of the texts of the books of Samuel um, would seem a little bit different to, to, the, to the Samuel that we're used to. But yes, by and large, um, there is already a, a, a sort of growing consensus. Um, and among those texts, so among that, that broad range of texts, there are some where you can go right down word for word, letter for letter, and they are identical. To, to what we end up with in the medieval manuscripts. We had a few texts which is eventually evolved into a few versions. One is probably mm -hmm. translated later on to uh, Greek mm -hmm. and was mm -hmm. preserved as mm -hmm. Siputan Gita, 
uh -huh. we call it in Russian. Se Septuagint, yes. Yeah, yeah. Septuagint uh -huh. in English. Uh -huh. And another one is the text, mm. what we call in Hebrew, Masora, Masoretic text. Yes, so among the Dead Sea Scrolls, I think it's slightly uh, out of fashion now, but, but certainly people used to speak of at least three different recensions of the, of the Hebrew of, uh, of various books. Um, uh, the sort of proto masoretic recension that, that eventually became our Hebrew Bibles. Um, a Hebrew version that looked more like the version that was translated then into Greek that are behind the Septuagint. Um, and some that looked even a little bit more uh, like the, the, the um, Pentateuch texts that end up in the Samaritan tradition. So yeah, but broadly speaking, those three strands. Um, the great majority, though, it should be said, um, of the manuscripts were already in the group of manuscripts that look most like the, the Hebrew manuscript, the, the, the Hebrew Bible that we that we read today. The number of texts that are like the Septuagint is relatively small, uh, and the number of texts that are like what becomes the Samaritan Pentateuch is a tiny proportion. Well over half the manuscripts, even at Qumran. Um, belong to the group which becomes the, the so-called Masoretic yeah. text. So you can assume that even that time, they mm -hmm. already preferred some version, some texts as the major ones. Yes, I, th I think that is a, uh, is a legitimate conclusion. Others would disagree, but I think that so is So we can completely... track down this text at least to the Qumran period. Yes. At least, and yes. maybe even further, because we don't know if it's... Precisely. That's what we found, but probably they had the texts before the Qumran. Precisely, yes. And, and if already from the earliest Qumran documents uh, there is evidence uh, of a real interest in the letter-by-letter -letter preservation, that didn't suddenly arise in the, you know, and happen to coincide with our earliest manuscripts. That doesn't make any sense. Presumably, that's reflecting an interest which then does go further back, even further back into the Second Temple period. The reason that you can be confident that your Bible here, which is a copy of this manuscript here from the year 1008, is actually um, a faithful representation of a text that goes way back to the Second Temple period is because of the work of the scribes who later became known as the Masoretes. The Masoretes, towards the end of the first millennium, codified, consolidated, but they were working from material that was already very, very old and had been meticulously preserved over the course of, of basically a thousand yes. years. Mm -hmm. So if I understand right, the main concern of these uh, Masoretic authors, mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know how better to call them, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, was to make sure that in uh, all the Jewish communities mm -hmm. in which are uh, situated far away from each other. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. eventually will read the same text and not only mm -hmm. read the same text, but they pronounce it right, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. uh, so all this tradition will be preserved identical in the, all over the Jewish universe. And in fact, they succeeded yeah. in that. So how they yes. managed to do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good. Um, and you're, you're quite right. They, the Masoretes as a group of scholars, let's say they arise from around about the 7th century onwards. And, and the bulk of their work is done from the 7th through to the 9th or 10th centuries. That, that's the sort of Masoretic era, we could, we could call it. So we've talked about how they received, they didn't innovate, they received a consonantal text um, which had already been preserved faithfully by their forefathers um, from, from hundreds of years, half a millennium at least, earlier than them. But they didn't just receive a written text, they also received uh, a, a traditional authoritative way of reading that text, a reading tradition. Um, since this is an English interview, it's probably worth pointing out that uh, uh, Hebrew is a consonantal language, and so lots of words can be written uh, that would be written in the same with same set of consonants could be read in lots of different ways um, so the example i often give to my beginning hebrew students um, the letters m l and k uh, could be king uh, or could be uh, a, a ruling or could be uh, the uh, canaanite god molech um, or 
any number of other alternatives. And it's only the context um, and the tradition, um, both of those working together, that enables you to, uh, uh, to, to read the text as it, was, uh, as it was intended, this authoritative tradition. Now, I think um, that we can show that that reading tradition also goes way back into the Second Temple period, so very, very early. Um, and it was passed down from generation to generation, father to son, teacher to student. Um, and so the Masoretes receive both of those strands and their great innovation was to combine them in, uh, in, in one text, in, in the, the so-called Masoretic text that, we're, that we are very, very familiar with. Um, so they were both preservers and innovators. The Masoretic phenomenon is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, unique. It's certainly very different to the situation with the New Testament. Uh, we're sitting in Tyndale House, which uh, has uh, one of the research projects of the last 10 years has been to produce an edition of the, of the New Testament in Greek. And the situation there is that there are lots of, uh, lots of small differences in each of the manuscripts, um, most of which are easy to, to sort through, some of which are more difficult. But the Masoretic phenomenon is, is really quite different. You can open any Hebrew manuscript from say the 10th, let's say from the 10th to the 12th century, of which we have dozens if not hundreds. And they could be written in one, two, at least three or four different centers throughout, throughout um, Europe and, uh, and, and Asia, down into North Africa. And they would be functionally identical not just that they would have the same words, but that they would have the same spelling of each of those words. So again, for, for non-Hebrew speakers, lots of Hebrew words can be spelt in multiple different ways um, without any change in the meaning. Um, so the words generations, uh, these are the generations of, uh, of um, the heavens and the earth, for example, um, can be written in four different ways. Uh, with no difference in meaning whatsoever, exactly the same word. Um, it depends on, on how you indicate the, the vowels, that's, that's the point. The Masoretes continued the tradition from the Second Temple period of preserving not just the right words in the right place, but the right spellings of the same words in each place. And so, extraordinarily, you could go to a manuscript written in Spain in 1200, and another manuscript written in Egypt in 930, open them both to the same page and you will find the same spelling of every single word, basically, basically, ignoring human, human error to a certain extent, but basically the same spelling of every word, every single passage, page after page after page. And they are manually written. We are speaking about the manual, course, manually written yes, manuscripts. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's so not it, a printing like we have today, which is easy to preserve Precisely, the same text. precisely right. Yes, so it, it, it's... it's it's a mind-boggling achievement how they how they achieved that level of uh, of accuracy and uniformity. It's it's staggering how they achieved it, and that was the great the great genius of the Masoretes that they managed this work of preservation and that they achieved it with such well spectacular success. Really, we can talk about the mechanics of how that worked. If you can elaborate more, yeah, sure. The easiest thing to do would be to to open a manuscript and have a look. You can see that you have the biblical text usually written in two to three columns, depending on where the manuscript was produced and which part of the, of the Bible it is. But then all around you can see these notes. Um, you can see that there are notes written above and below the biblical text, and then in the margins as well. Those are the Masoretic notes. There are different, uh, different metaphors. I like to use the metaphor of scaffolding that is built in and around the biblical text itself to ensure that not a single letter goes out of place. How did they achieve that? Basically, they did it by counting. <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands of instances of counting. So these notes down here indicate, uh, refer to a, a word on the relevant line. So 
and they're linked by a small circle just above the word to show that that note belongs to that word, whatever. And that note may say something like three, written with the Hebrew letter Gimel. You would take that, uh, that brief note and you would refer then to the, to the Masoretic notes um, ab above and below the page. And if you're lucky, you'll find um, the word that you're um, referring to and it'll say three occurrences spelt in this particular way. So maybe with a vav, without a vav, with a yod, without a yod, whatever. And then it will give you a brief one or two word um, uh, uh, portion of the relevant verses in the Hebrew Bible. Um, where that word occurs with that spelling. And so in effect, it's, uh, it's like this gigantic jigsaw that, uh, that they build out of, uh, out of the text, going through knowing the text back to front and inside out. And you've got to remember that they were doing all of that um, without any electronic means of searching the text or anything like that, purely by, purely by familiarity. Yeah, it's a huge work. Huge work, huge, huge work. If I remember correctly i think there are something something like 60,000 uh mazora this the, these longer notes are called the mazora mazora magna or mazora godola um um and there are about something like 60,000 of those um just that's in this in this manuscript amazing. and that's that's not exhaustive as well if we compare this text to the text which we found in the cairo geniza mm. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. How is that compared to between these two versions? That is a wonderful question and a big question to answer. <laughs> the Cairo Geniza, I'm going to give a very broad statement and then we can go into as much detail as you like, has shown us one, two, three, at least four immeasurably important things about the development of the um, Hebrew Bible. It has shown us firstly that what we think of as the Hebrew Bible um, is in fact just one uh, of at least four different types of Hebrew Bible. Um, now that doesn't contradict what I said earlier about the, uh, uh, the, the uniformity. Um, the Kairogeniza, not exclusively, but, but, but almost in its entire, almost um, exclusively, has shown us that the Masoretic text was preserved not just in Tiberias, north of Israel, but also um, among the Jewish community in Babylon. Um, so the same communities um, that, uh, that produced the, the Babylonian Talmud um, and the um, Gaonic um, uh, schools uh, were also interested in the preservation of the biblical text in Babylon. So there are two major centres. Um, what we look at and think of as the Hebrew Bible is in fact just the Tiberian Hebrew Bible. Um, the Geniza has preserved uh, hundreds of manuscripts from the Babylonian, the so-called Babylonian tradition of the Hebrew Bible. Um, you will be able to see that the, uh, that the vowels and the markings around the consonantal text look very, very different to, uh, to the, the Hebrew that, that we're used to in the Tiberian text, a completely different set of symbols for the vowels, completely different set of symbols for the accents. Um, and actually, um, it reflects a different pronunciation of, uh, of Hebrew, um, a pronunciation that doesn't distinguish, for example, between Patach and Segol. Um, uh, so uh, Melech, for example, will be written with exactly the same vowels as Na'ar, um, no difference whatsoever. Um, so in some sense, easier simplification. Um, some parts of the verb are pronounced differently. So linguistically, um, the Geniza has opened our eyes to the, uh, to the variety of, uh, of dialects of Hebrew. Um, well, also the Geniza, and now entirely only in the Geniza, um, we also have evidence of a third tradition of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, pronouncing and preserving the uh, biblical text, um, the so-called Eretz Yisraeli tradition, um, totally unknown before the discovery of the Geniza documents. Um, 
uh, uh, so only preserved for us um, by by between one or two hundred very fragmentary, very old manuscripts, um, but give us an insight into this third way of uh, of reading the the biblical text. But besides the mm. uh, reading traditions, mm. mm -hmm. uh, content-wise, there is a difference. Mm. The Tiberian text and the Babylonian text contain either no differences of interest or hundreds of differences of interest, depending on your filter, <laughs> depending on, on, again, how closely you're happy to zoom in. Um, so, no. <laughs> the, the Babylonian biblical text and the Tiberian Hebrew text are almost indistinguishable one from another if you look from from even a slight distance okay so difference was in the dialects they spoke differently yes. probably they pronounced the words differently but the content itself is more or less identical the content yes absolutely that there, there are a handful of places where the differences has any sort of semantic um, implication um, so lots of differences in, in spelling um, uh, lots of differences in pronunciation, hardly any differences that would actually mean that you translate or read a passage differently. There are some, um, and those are very, very interesting then to track through uh, how those differences arise. Um, but they're definitely um, a, a real minority uh, of instances. Yeah. If you stop and think that the, that the work of the Masoretes reaches its sort of its pinnacle in the beginning of the 10th century let's say it, it, it's sort of the, the climax of of centuries of work and typically the name that you hear is uh, is uh, Aaron Benasher Aaron Benasher um, the the last and the greatest of the Tiberian Masoretes um, he wrote um, a Bible codex that he worked on for many years, um, known as the Aleppo Codex now, which in and of itself is a, is a, a series of uh, uh, of discussions with Alex. Uh, so I hope you get round to talking with somebody about the Aleppo Codex if you haven't already. Yeah, that's, uh, um, um, that uh, it will be worth it. <laughs> um, he wrote that sometime at the beginning of the 10th century, and we've got manuscripts that predate that and so so in effect and we've got not just the the finished product the beautiful you know bound manuscripts we've got the working documents the working drafts in effect what we've got in the Geniza materials um, we can it, it's like going to the to the to the uh, to the desks at which the Masoretes are working and picking up the papers that they're that they're using in their research um, it, uh, it gives us a sort of behind-the-scenes access to their work um, in, a, in a way that really we can only dream of for, for lots of other fields. So to come back uh, to the, the, the so-called Leningrad Codex, the earliest complete copy of the Hebrew Bible. In the carpet pages in the, the back of the manuscript, you can see these beautifully reduced carpet pages, pages of, of Mazora. Now in uh, at least two of these, we have a note written by the scribe uh, where, he, uh, where he says his name and, uh, and describes some of his work. So this one is written in the third person, and we have ones written in the first person. Shmuel ben Yaakov katav v'neked v'masar et ha-machzor hazeh shel mikra min ha-seferim ha-mugahim v'ha-mvo'arim asher asah malamed ha-harom ben Moshe ben Asher nucho v'gan Eden. So Samuel ben Jacob, the name of the scribe, wrote and put in the vowels and the Masoretic notes of this codex of the, uh, of the Bible using the corrected and clear copies of the text which the great teacher Aharon ben Asher um, produced. So that, uh, that note, colophon, 
tells us an enormous amount. It tells us, firstly, that the, uh, that the chap who made his living by writing manuscripts like these was called Samuel Ben Jacob. Um, it tells us that he uh, already, in the year 1008, uh, was um, holding the work of, uh, of uh, Aharon Ben Asher, the last of the, the great Masoretes, in, in, in high esteem. He knew that, uh, uh, that he'd be able to fetch a higher price for the manuscript um, by, by making it a Ben Asher type manuscript. Um, there were other Masoretic schools available, so typically Ben Asher and Ben Naphtali were two, say, rival schools, but... Uh, but competing. But, com yeah, competing alternative, whatever. Um, so uh, so uh, definitely other Masoretes are available, as it were. But Samuel Ben Jacob um, comes alive to us because of the Cairo Geniza in, uh, in an extraordinary way. Before the discovery of the Cairo Geniza, we, we, we knew his name from the colophon of this one manuscript. In the Cairo Geniza, we have a letter that he wrote when he first arrived in Fustat and uh, hadn't yet got, uh, uh, got himself a job. Uh, and he was asking um, for a wealthy patron if he would support him. We've got uh, a contract written uh, between Samuel Ben Jacob and somebody else where Samuel Ben Jacob is agreeing to write um, a certain number of the biblical books for a certain price. We've got other bits of Bible manuscripts written by Samuel Ben Jacob and they have enabled us to to isolate certain scribal features that, that he uses throughout his work such that we've also then been able to expand and find other copies of other manuscripts written by him um, in, uh, in different collections throughout the world. So thanks to the Geniza, he has come alive as, a, as an individual, a person, the actual real-life person who wrote the manuscript, uh, who genuinely needed money and therefore had to write uh, when he first arrived, uh, who we've got his name as, a, a, I think, as part of a marriage contract as well. He was one of the witnesses, if I remember, uh, or it could have been a divorce document, one of those. <laughs> um, so it, uh, it really shows us the... Uh, the sort of social world, as it were, behind these manuscripts as well, um, in a way that... Uh, yeah. Amazing how history is coming to life. Precisely, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, is, that is the Cairo Geniza, history coming to life. So, yeah, extraordinary. Yeah. Okay, so actually I'm uh, always amazed when I'm touching this, uh, all the texts and, you know, uh, amazingly what we have in the Hebrew, when you, once you speak Hebrew, you can actually read texts from 1,000 years ago and even Further, if you go to a more big stone, mm. yeah, with mm. the text of the Meisha, king of Moab. Yes, yes. And uh, today you can read it. More yep. or less you can understand what yep. is, is written there. Yep. Amazing. Yeah, it's not Amazing. exactly the same language, but still it's preserved. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, for example, yeah. I remember in Russian language, I was uh, mm. reading this uh, text from 20th, uh, 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which is um, not that uh, old and anything, and it's very hard for a modern Russian-speaking person right. to understand the text. You wow. need usually to translate, to adopt it to the uh, modern language. Right. In right. Hebrew text, it's actually quite easy for any, mm. I don't mm. know, student in Israel to just open the text and read it. Yes. And most you yep. can understand, at least 80% of the text, just yep. straight away. Yep. It's um, always amazed me. Yes, yes, Hebrew, the, 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 the story of... Uh, of the survival and then the resuscitation of the Hebrew language yeah. is, uh, is a wonderful, True. wonderful thing. Okay, uh, Dr. Phillips, uh, thank you very much for this fascinating story. My pleasure, thank and you. Uh, thank you very thank much you. for coming.